All right, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have, I think, over 250 people online who just came in. So uh, thank you for everyone joining us online and for everyone joining us in person. I'm John Schwartz. I'm the Dean of the College of Public Service. Uh, I'm just gonna say my quick spiel on the College of Public Service and UHD, and then we'll get going with this event everyone's come to see. Uh, I'm really proud to be at UHD. We are the second largest college in Houston. We are the most diverse college in Texas and in the Southern region. And I'm especially proud to be part of the College of Public Service. We have education, which we're focusing on tonight, obviously. We have social work and we have criminal justice. Uh, and we have, we're winning awards in all of the programs. So education just got an award from TEA. Uh, we are doing US prep, where's Calvin? Doing US prep with Calvin. <laughs> uh, we are nationally ranked in our criminal justice program. Uh, and our social work program is currently the fastest growing program at UHD. So, so, and our really, our philosophy is to, that our students learn in the community. So they learn in the community of Houston, providing amazing experiences with people like these amazing superintendents. So, and we're lucky enough to be under the leadership of an amazing new president, President Lauren Blanchard, who I know got his hair cut especially for tonight. <laughs> Who, who really thinks of, thinks of UHD as an anchor institution for the city of Houston. So without further ado, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna introduce our president who I'm proud to work for, Dr. Lauren Blanchard. Well, I guess you're getting a good chance of seeing just how closely re related we are to one another within our college here, within our university, that he would know that I have gone to get a haircut this afternoon, but he was actually in my office and he was interfering with my schedule and I had to remind him that I needed to go and get a haircut is what the real story is. And then of course, uh, trying to get across the street today that I ended up, ended up taking a, a longer route around and we walked all around the, the jailhouse and everything else to get here. And I was a little embarrassed as we have one of our colleagues that's uh, visiting us right now uh, from Houston Community College. And so she took the long walk with us. And I know the whole time she was saying to herself, where in the world are these people taking me? <laughs> but we made it here. Uh, welcome all of you to uh, this event and more importantly, an opportunity for us to really talk uh, very candidly about uh, the importance of education writ large, K through 16 and beyond. Uh, and, and more importantly, really understanding the kind of synergy that's essential for us to have in place so that we really have a better understanding of our responsibility as it relates to what I call the continuum of education. That, you know, certainly in uh, the time that I have been in higher education, which is about 35 years now, I always like to look at it from the lens of understanding that students begin at pre-K and that we know that the end result is either they're going to be uh, in the going to graduate or professional school or in the workforce but that there's a continuum that happens from the time that they enter pre-K all the way that they exit, either at the 16 level, meaning their baccalaureate degree, or going any higher. But that the way that higher education oftentimes looks at it is that we hold responsibility only when they're here with us for that four to six year period, but they don't have the continuum outlook to know that they're really ours at the very beginning when they reach preschool level. And so it really becomes essential for us to have these kinds of conversations, but more importantly, have the kinds of authentic bonds and partnerships that really allow us to deliver effectively on the goals that these young people have for themselves and their families have for themselves. I'm a big proponent of student success. And really the definition that I hold is apropos to w re regardless of where you are on the continuum and that is that we hold the responsibility to make sure that a student is capable of completing a degree and not just a degree but a gr degree of value that ensures that they have the knowledge the skills and the dispositions that prepare them to 
not only go on into the workforce or go on to graduate and professional school, but that it also prepares them to become leaders in their fields and leaders in their communities. And so today is really a great opportunity for us to talk very candidly about our collective responsibility in making that happen. Uh, I don't know if introductions have been made or not yet. Uh, that's somebody else is doing that, or am I, am I doing that? I don't have the names of everyone on the day, as I'm just letting you know. <laughs> That'll be your job. All right, that's covered. That's great to know. Um, but you know, recognizing that uh, we not only have uh, superintendents um, and those that work within super superintendents' offices here that this should be a regular kind of conversation. You know, I remember back in the day, I can't remember which a presidential administration required it, but that every university had to create a PK through 16 council. Anybody been around long enough to remember those days? Um, and that it required K-12 and higher education to talk regularly about not only the challenges, but the victories that you can actually experience when you're working together as a team and thinking through what that continuum actually means for education. And so, you know, I say that that is something that I certainly hope that we're able to uh, talk through today, but also I wanna know how we at the University of Houston downtown can be the best partner to all of you. And I, I don't mean that in terms of lip service. I mean that very genuinely that you know, I believe wholeheartedly in the power of uh, having pipeline programs. I believe wholeheartedly in understanding the value of uh, interacting with parents as early as we possibly can. Um, and I also believe in the value of making sure that uh, our teachers that we prepare, who then go on to teach the students who then become our students, that we wanna make sure that we're doing the best job in preparing our teachers. And we want, I want candid information about what we're doing well and where our opportunities lie. Now, I know we're not gonna get all that tonight, uh, but I'm saying to you that let's let this be the first of many opportunities for us to connect and have that rich kind of conversation where we can put everything on the table and determine how we can move forward. Now, I know that we also have a special guest with us and she's sitting right here at next to me and I've got to pull out the paper to make sure I say her name right, Ms. Beatrice uh, Seha Williams, who is the Director for Hispanic Serving Institutions with the Division in the Office of Post-Secondary Education in Washington, D.C. And I'm really, really thrilled that you are here uh, to join us, uh, not only because of the fact that we are designated as a Hispanic Serving University as well as a Minority Serving University, but when you look at the uh, composition of the uh, University of Houston downtown, for which, you know, was a drawing card for me in terms of this university being the most diverse university in the South region, uh, in, in the United States. University of Houston downtown, I'll say it again, is the most diverse university in the Southern region of the United States. And that dovetails beautifully in terms of where we draw our students from, right? It's from our K-12 universities. But I also make it very clear that there's a distinction between being Hispanic enrolling and Hispanic serving. And that's where we really want to learn more and more from you um, and others to ensure that we've got all of the elements to ensure that when a student comes to us, certainly those that come from Hispanic backgrounds, but those that come from African American backgrounds uh, and other nationalities, that they know wholeheartedly that they are supported, they know that they belong here, they know that they are cared for, and most importantly, they know that they are going to reach their goals because we're giving them all the advisement and support that they need to do so. And so to me, when we talk about serving, that's how we serve students. We're not there, but we definitely need help in making sure that we are able to get there. Uh, and certainly through tonight, I'm hoping that we're gonna learn more there as well. So I think I've held the mic long enough, um, and uh, so I'm not sure who's next, but I can't thank all of you enough for being here and certainly can't thank you all enough for being here, and I'm ready to learn. Thank you so much, President Blanchard. Uh, I'm now gonna introduce our, our center director, Mr. Stephen Villano, and one of our amazing literacy faculty, Dr. Diane Miller, who will introduce the panel and talk about the proceedings. Thank you, Dean Schwartz. Um, I am going to, in, in the 
in the expediency of time, I am going to introduce our 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 guest from the federal government. I will. I want to tell you that uh, this was the brainchild. Uh, really, of both of us, but Diane, Dr. Miller, really uh, took on the mantle, and she said, "You know, we got to get somebody that really can speak to our students." And who is it? And she looked on the at the U.S. Department of Education website, and she scoured it, and she saw <gasps> Beatrice Seha Williams. That's the person I want. And lo and behold, I sent an email, and wow, she responded like uh, like I was, you know, emailing my sister. Um, and, and she has been just so, uh, just so gracious and, you know, she's, we were trying to pin down a date, but we couldn't because she couldn't travel because the federal government, uh, the budget hadn't passed. It still hasn't passed. So she wasn't sure if she can get here. We were going to pay for her travel, but she couldn't accept travel from the federal government. It was just like, oh my gosh, but she is, but she's here and she's here. And so we, uh, we just really want to thank you for, for being here. Um, and I'm going to read to you her bio. An extensive bio. Beatrice Seha Williams is the Senior Director for Institutional Service in the Office of Postsecondary Education at the United States Department of Education. In this role, she is responsible for directing and administering the divisions that support and administer the discretionary and formula grant programs to Hispanic serving institutions for which she previously served as division director, the tribally controlled colleges and universities, historically black colleges and universities, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions, predominantly black serving institutions, Native American serving non-tribal institutions, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian institutions, and other minority serving institution programs. The budget for the grant programs housed in institutional service is just over $1 billion. These programs seek to increase post-secondary education access, affordability, completion, and post-enrollment success. As the senior director, she defines and articulates program goals and objectives, identifies and implements policy changes needed to achieve goals and objectives, evaluates program effectiveness, develops and updates policy manuals, program regulations, proposed legislative amendments, I don't know how you do this and still have a life, uh, prepares budget uh, program requests and in conjunction with the Deputy Assistant Secretary's Office, prepares an annual funding schedule and funding strategy, incorporating the goals and objectives of the Secretary where applicable. I mean, it's just hard to even read. Um, prior to joining the Office of Post-Secondary Education, she served as a program manager for the teacher quality programs in the Office of Innovation and Improvement. As a program manager, she oversaw the administration of several discretionary programs, including Race to the Top, um, District Teacher Quality Partnerships, School Leadership, Supporting Effective Educators, and Transition to Teaching. Mrs. Seha Williams has also served as the federal liaison to the states of Florida, Arizona, New Mexico, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Ms. Seha Williams has presented at numerous educational conferences on various post-secondary programs and topics, school leadership, teacher quality, migrant students, and cultural literacy. Fellowships include the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Fellowship Program, the Department's Excellence in Government Fellows Program, the Education Policy Fellowship Program, and the Executive Leadership Program. Ms. Seha, Mrs. Seha Williams earned her BA in Sociology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and her MA in Education and Human Development with an emphasis in bilingual education and special education from George Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to, rep to present Mrs. Beatriz Seha Williams. Thank you, and um, thank you and, and welcome to everyone that is watching us from online. So I'm looking at the camera to you just to say hello. Um, so I, I really want us to begin the discussion with, with these amazing um, superintendents that we have. So I don't wanna take up um, any of their time because really I always say the answer's in the room, 
right? There, there is an issue. There is someone willing to, to put the time and the effort to get to that solution. Um, when he asked, how does all this get done? That someone, of course, helped me write my, my bio. Um, it's, it's because of a team, right? It's because there are a number of individuals that believe that education is the overall equalizer. It is through education that I am here. It is through education that I'm able to do what I do today. Um, growing up, I just shared this with one of the young ladies that, that I spoke with earlier, that growing up, my mom used to say, get a job that offers you health benefits. That was, that was her dream for me. Um, I opted to dream a little bit bigger and wanted to get a college education. And so I sought out those individuals and programs like Upward Bound that supported that, that dream. And so 20 something years later, I've been a school teacher. I've, you know, have worked at the Library of Congress. I have a job that I never dreamed existed. Um, I am, I think the, at, at this time, there was one before me, but I think at this time I'm the one Latina as a career that has reached the senior executive level. Um, and so unfortunately, there's still a lot of room for us to improve as a whole. There are still a lot of dreams that need our support in getting, you know, realized. Um, so yes, my mom now knows that my job does offer me health benefits. Um, they still don't know exactly what I do. And I'm sure that it holds true for many of you in this room. Um, but the simplest way that I share what I do uh, with my mom is that I am doing something to help young men and, and young women and, and everyone, um, especially those that are students of color and low income students. And, you know, I'm unapologetically Latina. And so I am the one that got the seat at the table, but I'm not going to be the only one. And I want to expand the table and bring more chairs. And so that's what I do in some way, shape or form. Um, this programs that that are offered here at the University of Houston downtown, I know offer those opportunities. And so they provide that first part, right, of that trajectory, which is access. Our jobs now are to ensure that we're providing the support systems necessary to retain these students and to help them walk across the stage with that degree or certificate. Because um, part of my vision and part of my job and what I do and what I want to make sure that we all amplify together is that I am trying to capitalize that S in minority serving institution so that that S stands for student success. You want to make sure that it's not enrolling, as you said, it is about serving. And so that when these students graduate with their degree, they in turn will serve other students. And that is how we keep the ball rolling. That is how many of us got to where we are. We stand on shoulders of a number of individuals. And so we want to make sure that when someone opens the door for us, we hold it open for others. So with that, I hope that this is an engaging conversation. I too am very interested in what our superintendents here have to say because um, no offense to you, but I am so happy to see so many women in leadership. <laughs> and so, and then, and I thank you for your service, but you know, I you know I speak from the heart, so. So I'll, I'll stop here and then let's continue with the program. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Ms. Seha Williams, for joining us this evening and setting such a rich national frame for our roundtable discussion that we're going to have. Um, I appreciate all of you being here, but I'm not your mistress of ceremonies for this evening. This is a student-run event. When Mr. Villano came to me and he said, what do you want to create? And I said, what do our students want to create? So Miss Monica Rodriguez is going to be your um, student ambassador for this evening. Um, Monica is a senior in our urban education department. She is the historian of the Kappa Delta Pi Education Honor Society. She's currently doing her student teaching at Post Elementary in Cy Fair ISD, Cypress Fairbanks ISD. And she looks forward to being, I hope, some of you at this table are listening, a fully certified EC through six teacher in just a few months. Um, and, <laughs> and so this evening, she is our official student ambassador. All right, take it away, Monica. Thank you. Good evening. In order to form a more local context, I would like to begin by sharing both UHD and the College of Public Service mission statements. The University of Downtown is a comprehensive four-year university offering both bachelor's and selected master degree programs and providing strong academic career preparation as well as lifelong learning opportunities. Located in the heart of the city, the university reflects the diversity of the greater Houston area. And through its academic programs, engages with the community to address the needs and advance the development of the region. The University of Houston downtown is an inclusive community dedicated to integrating teaching <laughs> Testing? No. Okay. I'll start that it's over to make sure you can hear me. UHD is an inclusive community dedicated to integrating teaching, service, and scholarly research to develop students' talents and prepare them for success in a dynamic global society. The College of Public Service provides students with the knowledge, tools, and humanistic practices they need to facilitate the advancement of diverse constituents and effective resolutions for public service issues. We strive to engage in dynamic research to improve the quality of our area schools, justice institutions, and social service agencies to instill scholarship, integrity, and responsibility in tomorrow's leaders. I would like to thank UHD for this amazing opportunity today. When, oh, sometimes being a student at the Northwest campus, it can feel as if we are being overlooked. However, we are still very proud to be UHD Gator. <laughs> When Dr. Miller asked me to be today's Oprah Winfrey, she had, she had no idea she was helping me with two major goals of mine. My short-term goal is to be a urban education student at hopefully one of these amazing districts here today. What a better way to know the school districts I'm applying to than to sit here at this round table with the superintendents who instill the rules and practices. However, when Dr. Miller asked me, she really had no idea she was helping me with my long-term goal as well. One day, I will work at the US Department of Education and lead the way in the new way of education. One in which bilingual students like me are proud, not ashamed, to speak two or more languages. <laughs> How 
However, that is enough about me. I would like to um, begin by asking our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves by addressing the following questions in eight minutes or less. <laughs> yes, that is my challenge to you. One, what are the steps you took to be a superintendent? Two, what is your overall vision for your district? And three, in what ways does your district's vision interface with UHD's mission? And why does it make sense that your district would work closely with UHD's Department of Education? Dr. LaToya M. Goffney, the superintendent of Aldean ISD, we will begin with you. Well, I am super excited to be here tonight and we're going to have an amazing teacher. Isn't she amazing? Yes. yes. And one thing I know for sure is you don't show up to the University of Houston downtown without your chief of HR. So my chief of HR is in the house. So, <laughs> so anyone who's graduating, please, please stop and see Dr. Villarreal. And we also have Dr. Ken too, who's one of our school assistant soups here tonight. So yes, <laughs> shameless plug. And you're going to know why later, shameless plug. But I am super excited to be here and I'm saying like who would have guessed that a little small country girl would have an opportunity to sit with someone from the U.S. Department of Education. I'm sitting at the same table as Mrs. Beatrice Seha Williams. Let's give it up to her one more time. She's excited to see women superintendents, but to see a woman, a woman of color in the White House. So thank you so much for paving the way and for being a trailblazer. And again, excited to have you in Houston tonight and excited to sit at this table with you. But again, my story is similar to hers. There's nothing about my past that would have predicted that I would be a superintendent or even be sitting here. Um, my, um, I, I tell this story just in case there are other students with similar challenges, but my mom was 15 when she had me and I never knew my father. I ended up being raised by my grandmother. My grandmother, she worked as a domestic. She cleaned houses. And my grandfather, he uh, mowed lawns and collected cans. And one thing they taught me though was the value of hard work. And they also told me to go to school and, and act right. <laughs> Cause you see my, my father, my father who I never knew, but my grandmother, she had a fifth grade education and my grandmother, she had a third grade education. My grandfather, grandfather had the third grade education. But anyway, long story short, the most important thing about him, because I'm concerned about the eight minutes, was the fact that he could not read. He wrote his name with an X. And he used to tell me, Tanya, if you can read, you can go anywhere. And so I took the opportunity to go to school seriously. When I tell you <laughs> that I believe in the power of education, I'm not just telling you what I think, I'm not telling you what I read, I'm not telling you what someone else experienced, I'm telling you what I know for sure. Without an education, without teachers who cared about students and making sure that I learned and didn't care where I came from, didn't care that my house didn't have indoor plumbing, didn't care that I didn't have an active mother, didn't care that my grandfather couldn't read, they just cared about me. And so what happened at school mattered for me and being the first in my family to graduate from, from high school and ended up getting other degrees, but I'm so thankful that education found me. I wanted to give back to others the gift that had been given to me. And so I'm really thankful. <laughs> I was uh, probably one of the youngest superintendents back in the day. I became a superintendent at the age of 31. Yeah, and total God thing. Started out in a small school district in East Texas, Cold Spring, Texas. Y'all probably don't know where that is. We had about 1,700 students, had four schools. And listen, I left it better than I found it because I recognized that I had to pay it forward. I could not leave it to chance because there were students who, like me, needed a solid education. And then after serving there five years, I landed in Lufkin, Texas, which is farther east. And listen, <laughs> we had about 9,000 students, but I'm telling you, I learned about diversity when I went to Lufkin. You see, Cold Springs is a small town, so everyone was pretty much white. And again, I told you my grandmother served as a wait maid, so the black people were kind of, there were a few of us, but we didn't have access. And so I moved to Lufkin and had more diversity. I never forget, I had more uh, Latino families, more Hispanic families but I had not had that experience in a small school. So guess what's the first thing I did when I moved to Lufkin? I started a group called Nuestras Madres because I wanted to learn about what families wanted for their children. 
See, I could have used the excuse that because there were no Hispanic board members and there were no Hispanic groups who were advocating for anything. I mean, there was no reason for me to do what I did other than the fact that the achievement gap was glaring. And I'm telling you, when I met with parents and they told me, um, my staff was saying, you know, they won't come to open house. They won't come to different events. So guess what my group, the New Estes Madres, did? We started Lufkin ISD event though in Espanol. The whole night was in Spanish. We had over 600 parents who came out every single time and they wanted to hear about the amazing opportunities for their children. And so I pride myself. I served for, there for five years, so that's a total of 10. And in 2018, listen, I got my dream job, Aldine ISD. And you're gonna know why in just a second. My dream job. I wanted to make a difference in a more urban area I also wanted to be in an area with an airport because <laughs> in Lufkin and Cold Spring is the country and I had to do a lot of driving. And so for those of you who don't know, and I hope you all know where Aldine ISD is, but listen, we're in North Houston. If you've ever flown out of Bush Intercontinental Airport, Mr. President, you're in the middle of Aldine. That's Aldine ISD. Many people think it's Houston, they think it's Humble, but that's Aldine ISD. We're 111 square miles of amazing possibility. And I'm telling you the context only so you can understand. I don't lead with this because zip code is no excuse, no excuse for outcomes. It's no excuse for low expectations. It's no excuse for any of those things that you read about. But I wanna tell you about where I am. In, uh, in Aldean, we have 73% Hispanic. So a wonderful opportunity to do some great things, great things for kids. In addition, we have 23% uh, African American. But perhaps the one indicator that really, really drew me there was the fact that 93% of our families are on free and reduced lunch. 93%. Little Tanya's, free and reduced lunch. So you can't tell me that what happens at our school doesn't matter. So you say, what is the vision? We have a, a bold vision and it's simple. We want our students to graduate from Aldine ISD with more than a high school diploma. We want them to graduate with choices and opportunities, because that's what it's all about. You got an opportunity, I have an opportunity. I'm living my ancestors, my grandmother's dream, my mom's dream, you're living the dreams, and so we wanna make sure that the dreams of the students that we serve are manifested, and the only way we can do that is through having great experiences in school. And so as we think about, um, and I'm coming to a close, but as we think about how do you make that happen? <laughs> it's hard work, but I tell you our students are worth it. In 2018, new superintendent looking, listening, and learn, learning, and involving the community and uh, asking what do you want? What are your hopes, dreams, and aspirations for your children? How can we move forward? 2019, we were outpacing every urban school district in the state of Texas in progress. And then 2020, COVID hit. And I know we're gonna spend a lot of time on COVID, but the one thing I wanna make sure of is that COVID doesn't become the new excuse for low expectations for black, brown, and students of poverty. And so as we think about that, 2019, we launched a bold strategic plan. We wanted to increase student achievement. How are we gonna do it? Literacy, I heard that there was someone in here with literacy. We've gotta change our literacy practice. I told you my grandfather had a third grade reading education. I told you that he said, if I can read, I can go anywhere. So what does that mean? If our students cannot read, they can't go anywhere. And I'm here to tell you, it's not an Aldean problem, it's not a Houston problem, it's across the state, across the nation, read the NAEP scores, look, look at every indicator, we are failing our students when it comes to literacy instruction. And so that's a priority for us. In addition, we have high quality instructional materials. We don't want our teachers going to teachers, paid teachers looking for lessons. We don't want our teachers printing lessons off of uh, Pinterest, teachers pay teacher or anything like that. And so anyway, my eight minutes are up, <laughs> so as I bring it to a close, you said earlier, and you, you said the mission, and you said all of that, but you said you are a Hispanic enrolling, but more important, you're Hispanic serving. And that is totally aligned with what we do in all the ISD. Our majority of our, we meet the needs of all of our students. We're predominantly Hispanic, but it's not about the enrollment, it's about the service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Goffney. Next, we have Dr. Lupita Inhosa from Spring ISD. Thank you. Thank you, and it's such an honor to be here. Um, newly appointed uh, superintendent, so I'm starting second month. 
Uh, however, I've been in education for 30 years. So I've been here for a minute. Um, my story, very similar to what you heard from Dr. Goffney, um, do want to just share a little bit because I have made so many connections with students and family members when I've had the opportunity to share my story. And there is a student here that I invited as my guest, and this is Guadalupe. Guadalupe, if you'll stand, which is my grandmother's name. So Guadalupe is a junior here at U of H downtown, and we didn't know anything, but she read the paper or watched the news or something and emailed me and said, you know, your story touched me. Your story reminds me of my my story. And so we were just, we connected via email, connected via text, and just couldn't come together. And when this event came about, and I had the opportunity to invite one person, and I said, nobody else but Guadalupe. It's her home campus here, but it also, it touched me because she reached out to someone that inspired her for that minute. And for me, um, that meant so much um, to me um, to be able to inspire other students. So I am first generation. Um, back then we were called Mexican-Americans, uh, born and raised in South Texas in the Valley. Um, my parents are both immigrants, uh, came to the United States looking for a better life, like so many of our family members. My dad is from Monterrey and my mom is from San Luis. When you talk about the education that our parents had, not there. My mom was 12 years old in second grade and she kept going to school because she wanted to learn how to sign her name and she wanted to be able to read. My dad did go to high school, but then that was the end because they had to go to work. So both families migrated to you know, the border and they both came across to find a better life. When you think about the lives that they led, you know, my mom and dad working in the fields, right, to try to save up money to do better. So when we came along, my dad said the same thing. Education. Mijita, tú necesitas una educación. You need an education. And he said to me three things, and I'm sure so many of your parents have said to, to you all, three things that no one can take away from you. Tres cosas, hijita, que nadie te puede quitar. Tu nombre, tu educación y tu palabra. Your name, your education, and your word. No one can ever take that away from you. And so when I think about that, of course, as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old, that didn't mean very much to me. Now, absolutely. So my dad and mom became U.S. citizens when I was at the university. And oh my goodness, we celebrated. They learned the Constitution. They memorized everything, things that I didn't even memorize, <laughs> that I never learned in school, right? But you know one thing that they were very proud of, and to this day, we speak Spanish. They only speak Spanish. If someone came up to them, they'll understand, they'll respond, but they only speak Spanish. And that is part of who I am. So I grew up as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old, reading the Spanish newspaper to my dad. Brownsville Herald was delivered in Spanish at the end of the day. My dad didn't know about bilingual education, but he did know that reading was important. So I learned to read and write in Spanish before I even went to school. I learned my multiplication and division facts before I went to school because education was that important. So for me, as Dr. Goffney said, and so many of you, we are living, I am living my parents' dreams. And they became a reality because of public education, because of public education and teachers that cared. I went into first grade not speaking a word of English. And oh my goodness, was it scary. But I had Mrs. Johnson, who didn't speak a word of Spanish. But there were four of us that were Spanish speakers. Everyone else was white. There were four of us that didn't understand. Now, it was very difficult. Yes, I was paddled. Yes, I went through all of that. But 
Mrs. Johnson kept us after school, after school to teach us English. I was in the one three section. At the beginning, I didn't know what that was. Within a week or two, I caught on what one three was. And I told my dad, when I go to second grade, I'm gonna get to the next level. Second grade, I went to the two two section. By third grade, I was in the three one section. <laughs> And you know, as kids, you yourself know when you were in that reading group, when you were in that class, which just didn't feel right to you. And so for me, the teachers made a difference. They inspired. For me, my parents were that important and that stayed with me because in schools, and it's happening today, you hear Dr. Goffney talking about how you can engage parents that do not speak the language. That's so easy to do, but that's not what is happening in the schools right now. I saw my parents go to every single PTA meeting, and guess where they were? In the back mm -hmm. with all the other parents. <coughs> they signed in every time, they sat in the back, but didn't understand a word of what was happening. So I was the translator telling my mom, my dad, what the principal said, what the teacher said, until I made it to sixth grade. Back then, sixth grade was still in middle school. My dad and all those parents standing in the back, and then one day, my dad raises his hand from the very back in the cafeteria and raised his hand, and if you know my dad, well, he's shorter now, but he was 6'3", tall, tall, white guy that people mistake for not being Hispanic. And from the back of the room, he said loudly, ¿Y cuándo me van a decir lo que está pasando en español? And when are you going to tell me what's happening in Spanish? Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Bowie, the principal, stood there, didn't know what to say, didn't know what to do. And then she walked all the way to the back and brought my dad to the front. Now, Mrs. Bowie could have turned around, said something else, but she did that, brought him to the front, had somebody translate, whole room in applause. So when I think what is education and what makes a difference, it's opportunities. Opportunities for the students, opportunities for those families. So what is my vision? What's my vision for Spring ISD? My vision is to provide that opportunity that opportunity that schools gave me, the opportunity that principals and teachers gave to my family. How do we align to University of Houston downtown? Well, first and foremost, I heard US Prep was here. So absolutely, we are doing the teacher residence program. We believe that our teachers, our future teachers, deserve the time in the schools. First and foremost, they need that time. And we believe in educating all students every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansa. I did quickly want to recognize Dr. Lupita Hinojosa, the spree, the first woman, Hispanic woman to serve as superintendent of, of Spring ISD. And I do want to recognize, and he's stepping out, but Mr. Bell is one of our former uh, board members in Spring ISD, and I appreciate his consistent support while on the board, but as a community member. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Gators. Next, we have Sean Bird, Chief Academic Director officer of HISD. All right, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm actually not a superintendent. I'm sitting with these powerhouse women, but I'm just the chief academic officer of the Houston Independent School District. And um, uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, superintendent House sends his regrets that he could not be here, so you, you get me tonight. But um, I want to just uh, also say that uh, among these powerful women sitting next to me is a mentor of mine, Dr. Jennifer Blaine, who hired me as my first, uh, she gave me my first administrator job in Spring Branch ISD. So it's really an honor to be here with her tonight. 
So uh, this is my 25th year in public education. I started out as a, a teacher in Ailey ISD, then uh, served in Spring Branch as a teacher and principal. And then I uh, moved to California, where I served as an area superintendent in Los Angeles Unified School District and chief academic officer of Pasadena Unified School District in California. Um, so I've been around a little bit, and uh, I uh, share some similar characteristics to uh, to the, Dr. Gaffney and Dr. Uh, Hinojosa. I grew up in a single parent family. My uh, father was a heroin addict who spent most of his life in prison before uh, dying in early age after he got out and uh, re-offended. Um, so, and my mom uh, grew up as you know, she, there are five of us in our family. Um, but one thing that she did well is she made sure that um, I got a good education. And she um, made sure that, uh, I, to her credit, I didn't even know I was poor when I was a kid until I went to high school. Uh, back then, Ailey ISD was uh, a very white uh, suburban middle class school district. Uh, and uh, when I looked in the student parking lot at Elsick High School, uh, there were lots of BMWs there. And I did not have that car. I didn't have any car. Um, so then I knew, I was like, oh, OK, something's, something's different here. But, um, but my, my grandfather was a very influential person in my life, and he was my father's father. And so uh, for whatever, even though my parents, I never, I only, I didn't really know my father. He was, he was in trouble for when I was a young child. But um, my grandfather told me, you can do whatever you want to do as soon as you get your doctoral degree. Of course, I was like seven years old and had no idea what that meant, <laughs> but it stuck with me. And I did get my doctorate in education. I'm a three-time graduate from the University of Houston uh, down the street. I uh, spent some time here at UH downtown uh, as a freshman. And so um, I uh, know what a quality public education is because I got one. And I had the great fortune of uh, having many great teachers in, in school. In fact, my eighth grade English teacher, who's the reason I became a teacher, uh, she was on my doctoral committee. She hooded me when I graduated. So it was a great story. Um, but the, and I've had the privilege of working in, in some of the largest school districts in this country. And uh, it's my privilege now to serve in HISD under Superintendent House, who just came to Houston from uh, Tennessee. And he is really, uh, he just, we're just uh, un uh, unveiling our strategic plan in the next couple of days with our board. But he, uh, it's really centered around equity. And uh, that's why I came back home to work for Superintendent House, because I believe in what uh, he wants to do for the children of this city. And uh, that's provide equity. If you know about Houston ISD, it's, uh, it's a decentralized district. We're the largest district in the state and the eighth largest in the country. But it really does right now depend upon uh, what school you go to, what kind of service you get. And we are going to change that. Uh, one of the things uh, we're going to do, we have six priorities. Oh, the one that I work with is high quality teaching and learning. And just like Dr. Gaffney, we're going to make sure that uh, teachers are not uh, left to their own devices to look on Pinterest or Teachers Pay Teachers or whatever other website. We want to honor the profession of teaching and provide them with the resources that they need, the instructional materials that they need, so that they can uh, spend their prep time uh, actually planning for those lessons without creating uh, new things. Spider, I'm so oh, sorry. sorry. It's a spider. Oh. Oh, got it. It's a dead spider. <laughs> I guess I serve some purpose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Save. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. All right. So, um, high quality teaching and learning. We're going to make sure that uh, kids have equitable access, and that's that's really uh, you know that that's what I got when I was a kid. Uh, because I was had the good fortune of going to a great school, great school district with with great teachers, and so uh, how do we align with UHD? Of course, uh, we're hiring, and uh, in our strategic plan, in our strategic plan, we're increasing teacher compensation to compete with our friends over here. It's going to be great. I think we're going to top them actually. Uh, so, but more on that later. Uh, and so uh, we are intricately. Uh, we're an urban school district. We serve. Uh, all, we have 284 campuses, all but 12 of those are Title I campuses, which means they are all serving children of poverty. So uh, we're, you know, we're an urban system and we need teachers from, uh, that understand and uh, can hold high expectations for children regardless of their uh, background, uh, because that's what our community expects. That's what we need to expect as we grow the next uh, generation of, of leaders. So thank you. Next, we have Dr. Jennifer Blaine of Spring Branch ISD. Thank you, friend. 
All right. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jennifer Blaine, and I'm the proud superintendent of the Spring Branch Independent School District. And um, before I start, I'm going to say a couple of things. So first of all, the U of H downtown teachers are the best. They, they, they really are. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, I, uh, so since you shamelessly plugged your person and so did you, I'm going to plug mine too. Karen Heath is sitting right here. She's our associate superintendent for human resources. She's amazing. Um, I also want to say that I am sitting up here with a, a wonderful group of people. I know every single one of them, but I'm sitting between two people who have mentored me since I was, gosh, an ass assistant principal, I think, and they are two of the mo most fabulous people on the planet, along with everybody else on this panel. So thank you to the both of you. So I have a little different, uh, maybe I don't maybe have as exciting of a story, but um, I grew up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. Um, which is just on the uh, just on the uh, northern on the border of Kansas, and um, I grew up. Neither one of my parents went to college either. Um, they 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 did not have the money or resources to do so. They got married very young. Um, I was actually born in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where my both families are actually from. And uh, been we moved to Bartlesville when I was two. So um, I grew up an athlete. A lot of the lessons I learned uh, were on the ball field. I was a softball player a catcher. Um, but one of the things that my parents always taught me, and I think you've heard it probably from everybody, so I won't belabor the point, but it, nobody can take your education from you and you, and you will get an education. And that was drilled into my, my head and my brother said every single day, the entire time we were at home and then some. Um, and we also were told it's not enough to get your undergrad. You got to keep going. So my brother's an attorney and um, I've had always been interested in education. So anyway, um, I uh, graduated uh, from college. I actually moved to Houston and I started off in the Aldean Independent School District. Uh, I spent 10 years there as a teacher uh, and an administrator. And I honestly thought I would never leave. It is truly a wonderful place to work and grow and just it really just just had so much fun there. Um, but, a, but a mentor of mine shared with me um, that there was became a point when I knew I wanted to do more. I wanted to impact a larger, uh, you know, larger group. And I really was looking at the superintendency and thought that was something I really wanted to do. And so um, a mentor of mine who, who was in Aldine at the time suggested that it might be a good idea to get a different experience, um, which was hard for me to hear because I honestly didn't think, and I've told Latanya this before, I didn't think I'd ever leave Aldine. Like I, I truly loved it. Um, but I did take that step um, with the Spring Branch Independent School District. That was 21 years ago. I had no idea I was going to stay there that long. <laughs> anyway, um, I started in Spring Branch as an elementary principal, and I've actually had every senior staff job except one. And it's so I, I, uh, I was uh, area superintendent. Um, I oversaw curriculum, which is Sean and I were together at that time. Sean's an incredible language arts teacher, by the way. You won't find anybody better than him. Um, <clears throat> anyway, started off um, over curriculum. I've overseen administration, um, a portion of technology. I've done operations. I've done it all. Like I said, the only thing I haven't done is, is to be the CFO. So it's been an interesting career because um, I have sort of have a lens into every division. So I stepped into the superintendency in 2019, just in time for COVID and 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and so exactly. And it's been a ride ever since. But I love it. Um, Spring Branch is my family. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the district. It's 44 square miles, not near as large as, as uh, my colleagues' districts are in terms of land. We have about 34,000 students. Spring Branch is a really cool place to be because it's like, it's like living in a small town in a big city. So we're in West Houston. It's 44 really tight, compact square miles. We have 46 campuses. Um, 62 facilities. We have 34,000 kids. And we have almost the exact makeup, really, of the city of Houston in the state of Texas. So we have 59% of our students are Hispanic. We have about 28% of them are white. And um, about 57% live in poverty. Um, and so we're really interesting because if you, uh, if you know, you're familiar with I-10, West Houston. So if you go south of the freeway in Spring Branch, you will see um, uh, Roger Clemens, all your, all, many of your major, and you know, Sean, many of your major uh, athletes, um, the whole medical center, like it, very, very wealthy. You, you can't even buy a postage stamp of a piece of land in Spring Branch south of the freeway uh, for under a million dollars. It's just very, it's, that's just that, that side of the district. Then we have um, 
another portion of our district that lives in extreme poverty. And so as a leader, it's really challenging because I, I think, you know, when you have a homogeneous group that you're leading, um, it's, it's, I don't want to say it's, it's easier. It's not as a leader ever, but it does come with its challenges because you definitely have different factions that have different ideas and thoughts about what you should be bringing to the table and what you should be doing. And my responsibility is make sure we stay together as a family and do we do what's right for all kids. And so it's, it's, uh, it's a, truly a great place. So talk a little bit about our vision. So our district has a vision and, and a goal, and we, we call it T24. Um, essentially, what, uh, what we believe is that we want every child, um, irregardless of where they come from, to be prepared when they walk across the stage and into life to either earn a technical, military, two-year, or four-year degree. And we don't want our kids ever limited by anything that we did or didn't do to prepare them. And that's very important to us. And so you've heard my colleagues talk about literacy. It, fundamental kids have got to learn how to read and I agree we don't do a good enough job of that and we have a long way to go so we've tried really hard in Spring Branch to streamline priorities and make sure from the board all the way down that we're aligned and and um, I learned in Aldine from a, a very wise uh, superintendent that less is more and you got to keep the main thing the main thing so you know we uh, we focus on literacy numeracy social emotional supports for kids we have, uh, we have some huge gaps with our EL learners. Uh, that's just being transparent with you. We've got to close those gaps. And then we have an intense focus at the secondary level on career and technical education. And so that, that's it. it. And if you go anywhere in our district, and Karen will tell you, and you ask people what we're about and what we're focused on, there is not a, a soul that can't tell you. We're that focused and that streamlined. Um, why I say that you, the, the U of H downtown teachers are truly the best, and Karen and I have had this conversation before. In Spring Branch, it's, it's, a, it's a great place to work. But it's not always easy. It, it, they're, they're such a diverse, it's such a diverse population, and um, you really have to have the grit and the tenacity and we feel like the students from U of H downtown ha come with that grit and tenacity. We see it in the classroom. We see it in their first year. And so because we are a microcosm of the city of Houston, the state of Texas, um, we need teachers that want to work in a diverse environment and are, are willing to think outside the box and be innovative and creative, yet keeping those foundational pieces at the core of what they do. Um, and so we're just really appreciative to be a part of this partnership. And so thank you to all of you. You guys, um, the, the program that you run here really produces tremendous, tremendous students. And before I hand it over to the next person I know you're going to introduce, we are hiring as well. <laughs> and we would love for you to come visit us. Thank you. I think I have lots of... Oh. I think I have lots of applications going out tonight. Yes. And closing out our fabulous five is Dr. Martha Salazar Zamora of Tomball ISD. Well, thank you so much. And yes, shamelessly, we are all uh, going to be passing out applications. But I did not bring my human talent chief, but I have something better. Um, I believe, Miss Mabel, where are you student teaching right now? Say it loud and proud, Mabel. Um, it's a branch out in Tomba. Um, not a lot of people know about it, but it is going to be great. Um, and I'm interested in teaching. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm doing my student teaching in the Tomba ISD district, and it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's right, you got there, Mabel, that's it. So she came over to me and said, oh my goodness, you're from Tomball? And then we made the connection. So there, talk to Mabel, um, because she's gonna help my human talent department today. Um, I'm gonna start with the end in mind. Why do we want to partner? What is the vision and mission and how can we continue to collaborate? I believe that what you're doing is providing students of diversity and that is what we need. Tomball ISD, many do not know this, is a majority minority school district. We're one of the fastest growing school districts with a 9% student uh, growth rate every year. And so all of the things that you've heard, I will not repeat them because they've been so eloquently said by my dear friends here. Um, but that is important 
important. So in Tomball ISD, we believe part of our strategic plan is that every child should find a place to belong, a passion to pursue, and a love for learning that serves them well beyond the years they're with us. I believe that connects very well in hearing from your president, from your dean, from others, and really, honestly, one of the friendliest groups. Just everyone out here is just smiling and engaging with everything that you're hearing. Um, I, I love that. I, I love the fact that you are so close, and yet are, we align very closely in what we want in our students for our students working together. So how did I get here? I'm the very proud superintendent of the Tomball Independent School District, but it didn't happen overnight. I've been in education for over 35 years. I want you to, um, I apologize, some of you heard us speak on Saturday, so um, just you know, tune it out on this one because you just heard this. Um, where were you on 9-11? Think about that for just a minute. Where were you and what were you doing? On 9-11, I had just started my first superintendency. And let me tell you, that long ago, yes, 20 years ago, there was nobody who looked like me, literally. I was the first Latina in many, many ways, and certainly the first Latina um, female, well, Latina, uh, Hispanic female in the school district as a superintendent. I've learned a lot along the way, and one of the things I've learned is um, taking a position, holding on to a position, and doing what's right for you. So I'm really speaking to the young ladies in the, in the audience, and most people who have heard me speak know this. Um, there's a time and a season for everything. So I left the superintendency for a number of years, and I had the great opportunity to come to Houston and work in HISD, a large urban setting, work with many of the ladies here as well, and learn a lot of experiences. But why did I do that? because I was the mother of two very young children and we moved to the Houston area and I had to make a personal choice. Everyone makes a different choice. For me, I wanted to make sure that in my 50s, which I am now very proud to say I'm in my 50s, that I would reflect back and say, you know what, Martha, you were a really, really good mom. My biggest fear is I would say I was a great superintendent and an okay mom. That wasn't okay with me. So I supported great leaders and I made a promise to myself, una promesa. And if, if you know, if you make a promise, you have to stick with it. And that promise was that when my youngest daughter, Matisse Marcel, graduated from high school, that I would um, pursue the superintendency again. And that's what I did. I pursued the superintendency and on April Fool's Day, this April 1 will be, f yeah, five, yeah, what a day, right? Um, five, in five years, this April Fool's Day will be five years that I went, I was a returnee. So yes, the superintendency didn't turn me off so much that I didn't want to go back to it. I was ready to do it, um, uh, mature and with a lot of, of life experiences along the way. Um, we all have, everyone in this room has a different journey, life story. Mine is slightly different. I just want to share one thing with you. All means all. I was a child in Keensville, Texas, but I was a part of the gifted and talented program and the special education program. Why was I in special ed? Because I had, I was in need of an ossicular chain implant. I was severely, profoundly deaf until the age of 17. So my mother taught me that never, ever let your disability be your inability. And so that's important. So you're probably working with students right now or you yourself may have a disability and think that you will not be on a panel one day like this and trust me, you can and you will if you believe and the people around you that support you believe that as well. Nobody gets here alone. These ladies, this young man, we, we do mentor, we support each other and I am so proud to see more women, no offense to my young counterpart on the end, but this didn't happen years ago. And so the fact that we continue to see more and more women, women of color, more people um, in positions such as this, I will tell you, I'm the proud founder of the Thalas, Texas Association of Latino School Administrators, and the past president. And I pick my associations very carefully. Also very proud member, I see Lindsay Pollack and of course Dr. Goffney, past president, two past presidents of the Texas Council of Women's School Executives. Pick your associations carefully. Make sure they stand for what you believe in and support you, not just as a student at UHD, but in your future. And I know we're kind of short on time, so I'm going to leave it there. But I do want to, again, encourage those of you that are going into education. We do have positions in a fast-growing school district, Tomball ISD up the road, where we believe that students are helping and creating the future. Be a part of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Salazar Zamora. Let's begin our conversation. We asked students in our urban education department to submit questions for this highly anticipated visit. 
As you can well imagine, we received many more questions. We tried to be as representative with our questions as we can, and we invited the authors of those questions to ask them in person tonight. Our first question comes from Mabel Barrera, and the topic is about COVID-19. Hi, good evening. I hope everyone's doing well today, and thank you for coming. I really appreciate all of you guys being here on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, so my question is, um, the pandemic has impacted and continues to impact education. How has it changed the way teachers teach and students learn? What kind of support have you provided teachers, students, and staff during this time? How has COVID changed the way districts function? What was the effect of lockdowns on student? Do you think these changes are temporary or permanent? Okay, how about we kind of parcel it out? <laughs> That's a lot of questions. I'm gonna get the conversation started because I we won't finish if we go for all of them. Um, COVID affected all of us in many ways the same and in many ways different. Um, recently, when asked a very similar question, the first thing that came to my mind was technology, right? The utilization and the fact that we are so better equipped. I ended up going though to my second thought, which, so, which was social emotional. Because although I think before COVID, we did a very good job in meeting the needs, or I'd like to think we did a good job of meeting the social emotional needs of students and um, of course staff and even our greater community, I'm not sure we did. I do know now we have much more wraparound services and a concerted effort to ensure that we're not just educating the child, but we're meeting the whole child to ensure that they are capable of receiving the instruction. We know we're not out of COVID. We know that things look better now, but we also know we've kind of seen this come and go. And so I think we kind of hold our breath. We have learned a lot. And I think that we will keep the COVID, the COVID keepers and things that make us better at our craft, the thing that assist us to serve all of our students even better. I know in Tomball ISD, that's what we're focusing on in, is ensuring that we continue to educate um, at high levels with or without this pandemic. So if we're just going down the line, yeah, I, I think I would agree with everything that uh, Martha said. You know, I think uh, when you think about the pandemic, I, I always, you know, one of the things I always learned, uh, again, on the ball field, you can't focus on what you can't do, you focus on what you can do, you know, so you, you got to, and so I think what we learned is that we can do a lot uh, when we put our minds to it, you know, and so we were forced into, all of us were forced into situations to pivot, um, you know, teaching and learning on a dime, and it happened. And and I, I would guess that would have been something we would have said we couldn't do. We would have needed lots of time to plan, but when you don't have it, you got to make it happen. So uh, so that's something I think that, um, I think if you were to ask teachers in Spring Branch what they learned from it is that they they can do they can do more than they thought that they could do. And I think it's given everybody a bit a frame of reference. That said, I think our teachers are super tired. Um, our, our, uh, and, I, and I'm concerned, and I don't, I don't recall if this is one of your questions or not. One of my concerns is teacher burnout, being able to recruit and retain really fabulous teachers. And I think our teachers have knocked it out of the park this past year, but I think they're tired. And in some ways, our, our teachers tell us this year has actually been harder than last year. And so I just want to keep that in mind. Um, I agree, you know, we, we were talking about the, the gaps in student learning. And um, when, you, when you think about it, and I think I'm going to get this correct, our, our seniors right now, the last time they were in school, they were freshmen. The freshmen, the last time that they were in school, and I'm talking about in school in person, obviously they were in school, they were sixth graders. Fifth graders were second graders, and second graders may have been kindergartners, and then we know our pre-K and K kids this year, some of them hadn't been to school yet. So, you know, you think about the, lear the learning loss, but also the social-emotional piece. Um, we're seeing um, a lot of mental health needs amongst our students. I, I, 
I would say that in Spring Branch, we already had some really robust services, wraparound services for social and emotional learning, both, both on the proactive and the reactive end. But what we're finding is we need more and that our classroom teachers are needing more training and more development on how you address those needs of the students in the classroom. And so, um, and I would echo everything that you said, and I'll, I'll go ahead and pass the, the, the mic over, but it, it's a lot. It's a lot, and I'm super proud of our teachers, all, all of our teachers, for everything that they did last year. You know, it's crazy. Um, it was March 6, 2020. Y'all remember the spring break that never ended. <laughs> <laughs> and who would have thought that within a week we would be able to stand up at home learning? I'm not saying we did it great, but we did it. We did. In addition, who would have thought a year later, a district like ours, 93% poverty, uh, and with different challenges and different mindsets. No one would have guessed that we could have gone one-to-one. -one. Everyone would have had an excuse for why we couldn't do it and all of the different ways in which we shouldn't do it and so on and so forth. So while I'm proud of the innovation that it forced, I'm proud of the teachers who did an incredible job, our child nutrition staff and everyone else who responded in a way that um, no one would have ever dreamed possible. And as we talk about it, it's kind of weird because we're still in the middle of, middle of it. Uh, but I do believe uh, that our teachers, it changed the way our teachers teach and our students learn in many ways. Um, we have been intentional about the supports that we provide for our teachers, uh, open up communication, because I said, and we'll hopefully talk about later, talent is gonna be so important. And as we think about how we care for our talent, we're making sure, number one, that we're paying our talent. We paid them a retention bonus. We paid them, we've had to pay them to give up their conferences. And so that's not gonna motivate you to come if we're asking you to give up your conference. So let me take that out. But, <laughs> but more important though, Lee, though, we're being responsive to the needs of our, our teachers. Uh, many of them ask for additional time. And so one of the things that uh, Aldine has become known for is giving the gift of time. When we were remote, we gave more remote, remote learning days. And even now, as recent as a couple of uh, weeks ago, we gave three Fridays off because we recognize that in order for our students to get the best, we needed our teachers to be at their best. And so we have really been focused on our teachers. Um, how has COVID changed the way districts function? You know, um, one of our priorities throughout the entire, before it even started, we said this in 2020, in March, I can still remember it, what were going to be our guiding principles. And I alluded to it earlier, but we wanted to prioritize safety without sacrificing learning. And so I say that because we didn't want to become so hyper-focused on COVID. Now we did the three W's, wash your hands, wear a mask, watch your distance. And we put out the protocols and did what CDC said and we even had a mask requirement. We're not gonna talk about it because hopefully by Friday we'll be home free if conditions don't change. But remember, we had launched a bold strategic plan and we recognized that the plan was so important, the priorities were important pre-COVID with the exasperated conditions that our students had gone through with the learning loss, it was more important post-COVID. And so we needed to make sure that we didn't get sidetracked by the fact that it was gonna be harder. You know, it would have been easy to say, you know what, we'll wait to after COVID to focus on all students. We'll wait to after COVID to focus on this new approach to literacy. We'll make, wait to after uh, COVID to focus on leadership development, retaining talent, whether it's opportunity culture and the different things that we, we're partnering with UHD, we'll wait to after COVID. We need to just focus on this. But the one thing I'm so proud of our team is we recognize the importance of the work even through COVID. Um, the last one, what was the effect of the lockdowns on students? I can't even have to tell y'all that. Can you imagine those of you, just think of my story or all the stories here. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be at home for a whole year in a home without plumbing, a home without access, connectivity. Our district, although we were located in Houston, we didn't have connectivity. I see the VP of T-Mobile in the house, and so she knows. We had to work strategically to get connectivity, get hotspots, and do some different things. And so um, I think it totally, totally impacted our students in, in many different ways. And the last question was, do you think these changes are temporary or permanent? I said yes and no because it's gonna depend on the leadership. You'll hear me say this all the time, leadership matters. And it takes courageous leadership. People can put up an equity plan and they can say we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, but when it comes to doing equity, modeling equity, truly manifesting the vision, hopes, and dreams for all children, when we say all means all, it's really important. So, um, great question. 
I know you're student teaching in Tumball, but it was a good question, Mabel. <laughs> I would echo everything that um, has been said. And, you know, for us, it meant the same thing, right? March 6th, we'll never forget that. You know, and we're, we're coming right up against it again. And I think so many teachers are thinking of that day and thinking of we never came back. And so for us, definitely staying focused on the main thing. And, you know, just like you heard, we have a passion for learning that's what we do but our priority is safety and so going into the pandemic we reminded each other of that continue that passion for learning but ensure that the priority is the safety and for us i would say the biggest impact that COVID has had is the exacerbation of that learning gap of the gap between those students that can and those students that cannot. And so we have seen that. Our students are 100% face-to-face in the schools, but yet they're so far behind. And so we had to do a whole reset. Last year in January, as we were planning for what needed to happen, we couldn't use the old mindset that even I used as a classroom teacher saying, I've got to intervene, I've got to reteach, I've got to pre-teach because the kids are not here. They have a year's worth of learning. And so that whole piece was reprogramming our mindset and reprogramming that mental models that all of our teachers had. And so we had to come forward with a plan that was an acceleration plan. Like so many districts, we wrote our, dis our recovery plan so that we could get those additional dollars from the federal program, right? We needed those ESSER monies. We also knew we needed to rethink the way we were going to educate our students. So we brought together teachers, we brought together administrators, we brought together families to talk about what does that recovery plan look like. And so our recovery plan is made up of five priorities. The very first one is ensuring that our teachers and our administrators are well prepared. So what type of training, what type of support were our teachers going to need, our administrators going to need when the students came back. The second piece was that high quality instructional materials, right? We couldn't allow, as you've heard HISD and Aldine talk about, we couldn't leave it up to chance because as a teacher, I'm going to find the easiest way. So we did, we invested 75% of our ESSER money on buying the materials, buying all of the online resources, buying all the licenses, all the manipulatives, all the paper, back books, all the workbooks, everything that they needed in the classroom and at home. Then we focused on extending that additional learning time. And what does that look like? After school, before school, extending the year. And last but not least, that engagement, right? That engagement in that instructional learning, which is that blended learning model, but also the engagement with the, the parents. And so keeping to that recovery plan is what is getting us through this year. It's actually, like we have said, and we were nodding over here, this year has been so much more difficult than last year with you know, students being out, teachers being out, the pressure, the burnout, that has been so difficult. But the commitment to ensuring that we're focused on the acceleration and not the remediation. And so it's a big mind shift, but being true and implementing with fidelity and making sure that we provide the supports along the way, but we've gotta be able to accelerate our students before COVID needed to increase a year and a half of learning every year because that's where we were. So now we're looking at how do you accelerate two years worth of growth? Because every day that goes by, they either take a step forward or they're falling further behind. And I think, you know, we were at a panel last Saturday and what we're preparing for now is for next year because this year, you know, we're giving it all we can. But next year, God willing, things are better. Next year, we're gonna start looking at students that are going to now even be further behind. Is it that loss of learning opportunity? Or are now, are we creating 
uh, a disability that now we need to look at potential special education when our teachers and our administrators do not know the difference that can be a problem and it can start ballooning somewhere else so we've got to be prepared the training for us this summer is to be able to ensure that we understand it's a loss in learning opportunity and not a disability that we may be create, creating because of that loss of an entire year some cases two years so that's what we're facing again our teachers have done an amazing job. Our leaders have done an amazing job. It's up to us now to set the foundation, to give them the resources, to make sure they're trained up, to be ready for what can potentially happen with our students next year. And I'll just uh, quickly add that I think that um, while the, the pandemic was uh, terrible in many ways, uh, things weren't great for every kid before the pandemic. So one of the things that a benefit of the pandemic has been that we did learn some new things and we do uh, leverage different uh, teaching um, strategies. And so uh, hopefully we're gonna come out stronger for kids in the end. And fortunately for us, uh, we have a new superintendent who has uh, put forth a strategic plan that now uh, in my office, we're accelerating the rollout of uh, high quality instructional materials because we need to make sure that kids are not, uh, we're, that's, we're not just remediating kids and oh, bless their heart, they can't. We, we know kids will achieve at the level that, of expectation that we set for them. And so we're gonna provide uh, those quali high quality materials and train our teachers and how to use those. So it also also a delicate balance because teachers are really tired and deservedly so. They've been through a lot and they are uh, turned on a, on a dime. And so we have to balance like how we train teachers and support teachers, but also, uh, and, and the new curriculum that we're implementing is, is not, it's not what we learned in college. I mean, I, I never taught in a conceptual math. So it is, it is different and it requires a lot more, uh, um, work, uh, from teachers, but you know, so from the central office perspective, we are kind of, um, the academics team is really rebranding itself to be service oriented to schools and really be elbow to elbow with teachers as they're implementing. So my team's spending a lot of time learning the curriculum so they can go out and really um, help teachers and model so that they'll be able to uh, implement that curriculum. If I could just add, um, I think on the federal level, we've also have recognized that education um, encompasses the, the whole child, right, and family support. And if anything, it also shined a light on the importance of mental health. And so we have um, priorities that we are embedding in a number of our competitive grants that focus on wraparound services for students that focus on um, just services, not just for the students, but also for families. And then um, I think that this is also an opportunity for institutions of higher education to rethink what we conceptualize as teacher preparation programs. So there's an opportunity to incorporate a lot more um, integration with maybe our schools of psychology or some of our other um, programs that are on our campus. Maybe it's an opportunity for an institution to continue to serve those students that we've graduated, right? So if you've graduated from this institution, you've gone out to teach in a particular district, why is the possibility for you to come back to that school that trained you, not an additional opportunity for you to to maybe get some some just conversations, some build some communities of practice with other teachers, so that you can find those support systems, not just in your school district, but also in the school that prepared you for that school district. So I think we have to also think about the possibilities. And someone said it in this room that we cannot allow COVID to be an excuse. Thank you for the detailed answers. I appreciate your time. Before our second question comes up, I just want to do a disclaimer that please don't feel like you have to answer every question, but if you want to, please, of course, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> our second question comes from Jessica Diostado and the topic is teaching as a career. 
Good evening. I just want to say thank you to all the females I see here today. Nothing against the fellas. But I personally believe that we're going to change this world by educating our minority females. Um, so that's just my vision and my passion. So my, t <laughs> so my, my topic is teaching as a career. But I think at this point, teaching is a passion for a lot of us. So my question can be a result from COVID or just burnouts that could be from COVID, or I hear that the district requires us to do a lot of things. So it was reported recently that new teachers are leaving the job at a job after the first year. What do you say to future teachers who are in the teaching program now getting their teaching degree and are seeing or hearing all the negative press about the teacher shortage across the nation and the impact it would have on their first year teaching? In a, nut, in a nutshell, what is your advice for an effective first year? And what assurances can you give to those future classroom teachers that teaching is still a worthwhile career path? I would have to say that teaching is a worthwhile career path because you're changing lives. You are changing lives. And you see it from everyone that's here at the table. Um, so it has to be a passion for you. And I think we've talked about, you know, and you see it with everyone here, that we're truly committed to the work. We talk about it not being a mission, but a ministry, because it comes from without, within. You feel that burning in your belly. I used to look for teachers that had that fire in their belly, right, that you care about people. And that's the number one piece. The second piece, what are we doing um, to ensure that that first year teachers are taken care of? Because yes, when you, I mean, it's every morning we get our um, articles and, you know, ASCD, whatever you, journal you are opening that morning, it says hundreds of teachers leaving the profession in droves, you know, burnout and, you know, X, Y, Z, and it goes on and on and on. One of the pieces that you, every district has in place. I know in spring, um, we are a small district, 33,000 students, 40 schools. But at the end of the day, it's that one campus. And we believe in being a family and taking care. We say we take care of our own, we grow and develop our own. So forming that community. I know in spring ISD, we have not only at the campuses, you will have your team with your mentor that will walk with you all the way through every <coughs> single day, but also at the district level. We have a program that ensures we are touching base with every single new teacher. And so not to feel isolated, not to feel alone, most importantly to know, you know, when they say, oh, education is a lonely field, you get into your classroom, you close the door and you teach 22, 30 kids and then you go home, it is not. It is a relational um, uh, program. You build relationships not only with your students, but you build relationships with others. You do become a family. So regardless of what you're reading in the media, what people are putting into everyone's mind, that's not what's happening in these districts and that's not what's happening in our campuses. Are teachers tired? Absolutely. Do at the end of the day, do we have tears? Absolutely. I think, you know, everyone, don't, no matter where you're at, you're going to have those tears, but you know that you have that support system within your school and within your district. Um, so don't be isolated. And then, you know, what we just heard right now, the challenge to the universities, how do the students that just graduated, how do they come back to this nest, to this place that was their incubation period here to form those cohorts, to come back with your friends that you spent three years or four year with, um, to form that PLC, to form that collaborative, to say, how's it going in Aldine? Oh, how's it going in HISD? Well, we do it this way and exchanging those ideas and taking care. And the last piece that I have to say is your school family takes care of you. And I'm saying family, the communities. I know as a classroom teacher, I didn't need to eat breakfast because my parents brought me taquitos every day. As the principal, I didn't have time. My parents took care of me. We take care of each other. 
Good. Yes, 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 yes. Totally agree with everything she just said. And um, while I acknowledge there's some truth to the press, but what I'll also tell you as someone who's been a superintendent for 14 years and had a pretty bad week in the press this week, don't believe everything that you read. Don't believe everything that's said. They magnify the problem. And so let me tell you, every single Monday, I begin my um, week in classrooms all across our district. And I tell you, you have some teachers who are doing incredible work. And you don't see teachers moping. You don't see sad faces. You don't, like literally, <laughs> it is so exciting. And I know we have some young people, and y'all are young, so follow hashtag All Dean Anywhere or follow me on Twitter. And everything, we share everything. Because if we don't tell the good news, if you were to listen to what the media says, I don't even know how we're having our doors open. And so what I'm so thankful for is our teachers are leaning into their why. Teaching is not a job that you just go sign up for, complete an application. You're normally driven by a purpose or a higher power or you have a why. Either a teacher made an amazing difference for you or you had a bad teacher and you want to make sure other kids don't have that experience. And I recognize the challenges have been exasperated, but I also recognize that there's great opportunities uh, in all of our public schools across our great city. Um, in Aldine, we do have a uh, leadership definition. We strive to connect, inspire, and have an impact. So we have great principals leading our campuses. Because we recognize that as superintendents, sometimes we don't know about the experience, but we have great uh, principals. We have one of our principals at one of our um, ATSI campuses. He's here, and wait, wait, wave your hand. And I'm telling you, uh, one of our best, Mr. Torres, Eric, uh, he's just amazing. And so he's hyper-focused on making sure our teachers have the support that they need. So that, like a smaller learning community. Uh, but when you think about connecting and inspiring and having an impact, that's serious. And we expect our principals to connect with our teachers and we also recognize that relationships matter. And lastly, I'll say that it's so important, uh, we believe as a Holsworth district that feedback is a gift. And so we don't expect uh, principal, uh, teachers to exist in silos. We have all the, the normal supports. We have our new teacher supports. HR does an incredible job. Our school assistant soups do an incredible job. But we have advisories, teacher advisories. In addition, we do surveys, and we are very responsive, very responsive to the needs of our teachers. We have a, a union. It's not as big as other states, but we have a really responsive relationship with them. We meet with them and just to hear the concerns of the teachers, and we try to act and move forward in that same way. But we provide the support. And, but ultimately, I would say um, don't listen to all the things that the news magnifies. Uh, continue to be driven by your why and your passion and get in a school district that fits the passion that you desire to, um, to improve. I don't, I don't think I can add, add much more than what they've said. I mean, they've really kind of summed it up. But uh, teaching is a passion, and there's nothing like walking into a classroom and seeing a face full of kids. And sometimes, you know, w we always tell our teachers and our, and our bus drivers and, and everybody that works in the school system, you know, you don't know what kids are going through at home. But, but when they come to school, you, you, you may be the first face they see um, with a smile on your face, and you have no idea the impact that you have on these young minds and these kids and the sky's the limit for them. And so I would also advise that I think Latonya said it perfectly. Like don't, like I want to tell you, don't even turn the news on. I mean, they just make stuff up. I mean, I'm not even kidding you. So um, it's it's not like that. And they do magnify it like a hundred per a hundred times. It, why? I, I know not, but it's a education. You should, is you just won't find a better a better profession, a better calling. Um, and our future is depending on our teachers. We need great teachers and great leaders. And so do not let whatever it is you're hearing deter you. We all, all, all of us have great programs centrally to support teacher. We, we, in Spring Branch, we have a three-year induction program. It's extremely structured. We touch base with every single new teacher Every single day, they not only have a mentor on campus, there's somebody coordinating that at the central office level. Um, I talk to our new teachers. Karen talks to our new teachers. We're very connected with them, and it is like a family. And when you think about 
a lot of our young teachers come and they may be they may be living in a big city and they may not even have any family here. So, you know, that's that that's the other piece of it. It's like being connected with that Spring Branch family or that Spring family or the Aldine family, the Tomball family, the HISD family is just an incredible it's an incredible thing. Um, and I just I just I, you know, teaching is a calling. And I would say don't listen to what people uh, don't listen to the noise. Keep your head focused and do the right thing. So I may pass on another question, but I cannot pass on this one. Um, when you asked the question, I was thinking of Belen Flores. Now, who is that? Nobody in this room knows who she is. She was my first grade teacher. Of course, I was that child who had amplification prior to a surgical procedure. And she recognized that my dog, yes, my mixed mongrel, was my best friend. And so in Keensville, Texas, in first grade, my dog and I got perfect attendance because it, there, I'm in the newspaper. I have that article. <laughs> Little did they know I would one day grow up to be their first Latina superintendent, right? But when I say be that Belen Flores for somebody, everybody has that teacher. It may not have been your first grade. It could have been your an eighth grade teacher. It could have been the person who taught you how to read. It could have been that person who helped you on your lowest day when a family member died, or maybe your highest day and just helped you celebrate. That's what educators do. That's what we do. We support people who do that. And it's not just incumbent upon the teacher. It's everybody. It's that, that transportation, that bus driver that teaches children how to behave correctly on a bus. It's the child nutrition who, who teaches them as they're serving the meal. And of course, the classroom teacher that we work endlessly to try to support them during such a difficult time. Krista McCullough said before her ill-fated challenger mission, I touch the future. I teach. Think about that. Krista also said, education is a profession that makes all other professions possible. We wouldn't have any other profession if it wasn't for teachers. So we need to remember to adequately support them, pay them, respect them, and love them. I've often said, I can, I can work with anybody if they have the heart for what they do. If they don't, then we might have to find another career opportunity for them. But in education, it's it's hard to be a teacher right now. I live with a young lady who just, in my home, who just graduated, um, and I couldn't be prouder of, of, of her as my own child uh, who is going into special education. Could have picked anything, bright young lady, but I know she's found her passion in being an autism specialist and will, will make a difference in many, many lives. And so we, as leaders, want to ensure that teachers feel that love, feel that support, and continue to serve all students. Thank you. Our fourth question comes from Ismael Garcia, and the topic is classroom resources. How's everybody doing? Um, Budgetary cuts always seem to be. Is that, is that, that's not my question, is it? Is it? Okay. <laughs> it starts differently than I had. Uh, budgetary cuts always seem to be a concern in education, and classroom resources are a major concern for new teachers like I plan to be in less than a year. What are some ways a teacher could build public support for their classroom, and what are some ways a teacher could ask for support in their classroom? Yeah, uh, uh, this will be a quick one for us because all our teachers have to do is ask. Um, we are uh, very intentional about providing resources for our teachers and making sure they have the necessary supplies they need to uh, make a difference in the classrooms. We're very fortunate. Uh, our district benefited uh, handedly by House Bill 3 funds. In addition, we have the ESSER fund. So right now, it's not about resources. There's no lack of resources, thankfully. So thankful to the U.S. Department of Education, we have lots of resources right now. Yeah, I would say in my career, this is the best time in terms of resources. With the ESSER dollars, we've been able to really provide teachers with anything they want. We've actually just invested uh, $27 million in our fine arts programming. So all of our high school band uniforms are new. Well, we replaced uh, band instruments. We've uh, repaired theaters so they have sound and lights. We've put dance floors down. So all those things that are typically from budget cuts, uh, we've been able to really um, 
leverage federal dollars to do to uh, make happen. And so teachers, there's really no lack of supplies uh, these days. So it's, it's a great time in that way. I would just say ditto, just ask. We, just like they said, the resources are there. The districts this year and next year, you know, it's a very limited time with those ESSER dollars. So we are taking advantage of it. Um, if you are student teaching now and you're in the classrooms, just ask for what you need. And I know that that principal, that teacher, or any of us will be able to support. Thank you. Thank you. Our fifth and final question comes from Paloma Esparza Guerrera, and the topic is student achievement. Good evening, everyone. My topic is student achievement, and the question is, what is being done to bridge the achievement gap that has tight links between economic inequalities and achievement gaps? I, I would say for us in Spring ISD, that is, you know, I think we talked about that during COVID, we were able, we've always known there's been a huge economic and inequity um, division happening in our, stu in our students. But now through COVID, it was, you know, it's glaring, like we know and we see it. So for us in Spring, we've been able to truly invest in our students. Uh, first and foremost, thinking about what does equity mean and how do we actually make it a reality? So looking at how we distribute our funds. Um, we had a, what we called a zero-based budgeting uh, system and we built our budget up, but it was still based on the same things, that every school needed the same thing. So putting on a new lens and looking through that equity lens. So while every campus in our district has a nurse, has a counselor, has an assistant principal, all of those things we were allocating as if every single campus was the same, just like they had 700 students and we gave them the same. And so beginning last year, we stopped and said, no, those inequalities are now even more um, resounding. So as we looked at the student population, some schools now have two counselors. They may even have two counselors and a social worker. So based on the needs to be able to respond, um, same thing with our ESSER funds, you know, being able to provide interventionists to our schools. Well, everybody gets one interventionist for reading and one for math. Well, no, not really. When you look at the campus and you look at the scores of how the students are doing, a campus may need three reading interventionists and maybe no math or three math and one reading, right? So putting that equity lens as to how we distribute our resources, whether it's staff, it's money, it's books. So for us, we've had that opportunity. I think the last thing would be um, to be able to look at the students and their academic achievement as individuals, right? Um, we have all kinds of systems that is a, you're able to test and, and it tells you exactly how the student is doing. Well, are we using those reports to truly form small groups to address the students? We may all be in second grade, and we may all have a problem that is reading comprehension, but what in reading comprehension do I need that's different than his, that's different than hers? And so we talk about, you know, as um, a classroom teacher, everyone was behind in reading in my class. So I gave everyone the purple robotism. But in reality, you know, my cough is different than his cough, than your cough. So some of us may need the purple one, some of us need the red one, some of us need the orange one. So really working with our teachers to understand those learning gaps and to be able to differentiate the, the instruction and for us being able to provide the resources that teachers need to differentiate that instruction. I'm, I'll, I'll take, because I'm just going to really add on what Lupita already said. I also think, you know, in Spring Branch, we have a really um, uh, interesting way in which we allocate resources and allocate particularly personnel to campuses. And so one of the things that we hold near and dear 
to our hearts is that the people closest to the action, your teachers and your principals at the individual campuses, they know what they need. And they should be using that, they should use be using both quantitative and qualitative data to drive those decisions. And so it's our expectation that our campus principals working with their teachers are utilizing those multiple measures or those key, you know, key performance indicators to determine what their campus needs. And then from there, it's, it, you know, it's not only about allocating the money and the budget, but it's also about people. So on some of our campuses, we, we, we allow our principals to what we call unit exchange. So if you have X number of, um, teaching units or units on your campus, you know, you might see one principal who will say, um, I need two assistant principals um, for whatever reason. And another principal may see, I only need one, but I need two interventionists. So we allow them that flexibility to unit, to exchange staff, and to create positions based on need. And I think that's super, super important because I think one of the things Lupita's saying is, so not everybody needs the same doesn't always mean equal. Like when, when you know, people... Uh, we have to meet the needs of our campuses where they are. And I believe that that's not, I'm not always the best person. My senior staff is not always the best group to determine that. Like we have to listen to our campus principals and our teachers and listen to what they need and what they're seeing on campus is what do the data say and allocate resources in that fashion and then hold people accountable. You know, once, once you have those resources, then, you know, you have to look at what the end game is and you have to look at that formatively along the way. Perhaps what I can add is the fact that in Aldine, we focus on four T's. And so just go with me for briefly. Time. Number one, we think about time. We, I introduced you to uh, one of our principals, Mr. Torres, and he is the principal on the campus that has ADSY. It's the additional day school year. And so we have two campuses in which we are providing additional time. Uh, not only have we looked at extended school year, but we provide summer experiences. We don't do summer school. We don't do summer intervention. We have a summer camp experience, which is sort of like how you want your kids to experience the summer where you go to museums and you go on trips and you do some other things. And uh, that's what we provide. So we have these incredible summer learning experiences that have uh, are just incredible. So that's during the summer. In addition, every single campus has funds, whether they want to have additional time in the evenings, time on Saturdays, in which we, they can pay their staff in order to have these bursts of of opportunities for our students. So you think about time. Of course, we've talked about uh, talent in many ways because we need the very best teachers. And I, I guess our our partnership with um, UHD has been phenomenal because we are trying to get the best talent for the students that we serve. We want good teachers. We want good assistant principals, good leaders. And we have a couple of partnerships with UHD. We have the Homegrown Bilingual Scholarship Program. And we have Ms. Castillo here right now tonight. Um, basically, she is a paraprofessional. She's been with our district for two years. And so it's a perfect pathway as we grow our own and get invest in our talent that we have. So we're not going out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You have some incredible paraprofessionals who are teaching, and so this is a way to get even more. In addition, we are exploring other uh, talent, uh, ways to strengthen our talent. We have opportunity culture, and what I tell you is one of the most, I'm t I, I, I say this openly, and Dr. Vidal, he's smiling because he knows that I didn't really want to do it. But when you see it in action, it is phenomenal. You have some of your best teachers who, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> I hate to be the bad guy, but unfortunately, these topics will not be solved in one night. <laughs> we all have to be to work tomorrow, and as a student teacher, I may not get paid, but I do have to be there bright and early. <laughs> Every good thing must come to an end, and our amazing college dean, Dean Schwartz, has a few words to close us out before we leave. Oh, and I almost forgot, we have gifts for you. Mabel, can you come help me? Yes, I'm, I'm gonna talk while we pass out the gifts. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce our provost, but first I have to say a couple words because I'm really impassioned by what I heard tonight. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. Thank you for your expertise. Uh, we're gonna, with your permission, we're gonna post this on our website because I think our students need to hear about your passion for education, your care about teachers, and your hope for your students. So thank you so much for, for the time you gave us today. I wanna just give a quick plug to UHD. Fran Victoria came out, brought her kids out to support. 
I want to I want to say uh, we have some as you innovate in districts. We're trying to innovate as we train our teachers. So I'm looking at a lot of our faculty in the room. We're working hard to be innovative. We have a new Call Me Mister program. We're partnered with HISD on that to recruit and train men of color into teaching. Representation matters in teaching. We have US Prep, as I mentioned. We are thrilled. You mentioned opportunity culture. We're thrilled by the residency models. Our, a lot of our students come from poverty, and student teaching is really hard. And that's where a lot of our students don't make it through. So, uh, so we're, we're excited to be partnered with you, and we're excited to, to join you in, in really working for our future. So thank you so much. And I want to introduce our amazing provost, Dr. Keith Usman, to close us out. Thank you, John. That was way too generous. Um, I have been totally inspired and humbled by what I've heard tonight. And I, I thank you so much for coming. I want to thank the virtual audience out there in cyberspace for joining us, as well as those of you who chose to be with us here physically today. It's always great to have people in physical space. This is where conversation can be really rich, and I hope we can have a lot more of it um, in the near future. I was listening to some of the, the metaphors we talk about teaching, one of the things that struck me is, um, uh, given the state of the world right now, what's going on across the ocean, war is breaking out, and as a country, we participated way too much in it. And you hear the notion of nation building as part of an outcome of war. But what's going on year after year is nation building by teachers. Teachers build our nation. Uh, each year, they, each generation, it's a little bit different and it holds on to usually the best and tries to minimize the worst of going into the next generation. And so as teachers, all of us in this room, in various ways participate in nation building. And I hope we can all hang on to that as a positive way of thinking about what we're doing in these tumultuous times. I'm a biologist. I'm a biologist probably first before anything else. And so I'll tell you, climate change is something that will impact the way we think about teaching from here on out. COVID is just this stark example of what it can do to our society and the way we see the world and how we interact with it. And that's what we have to teach our children and how we have to teach ourselves and how we have to make space. Um, one last biological thing and we'll close it is I've also been watching the stress and strain of our faculty, of our staff and our, and our administrators in dealing with the last year. It is harder. Um, we hit 2020 in March, adrenaline got us through that first year. And those of you who know any physiology, adrenaline gets consumed by the body. We turn it off very quickly. We degrade it very fast. The rush is over. And then meanwhile, it's the stress hormones, the cortisols that are building up. And they don't turn over very quickly. And they take its toll on our, on our bodies and on our psyches. And we have to make sure that we can find ways to make space so that we can allow that to dissipate as it needs to dissipate and help us manage it. Thank you again for coming. See you tomorrow at breakfast. Um, <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, this is part one. Uh, part uh, X plus one will be in about a year from now. <laughs>